Psalm 31 verses 1 to 5 says, To the leader, a psalm of David, In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me. A strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Psalm 31 verses 15 to 16 says, My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord.
Our Bible reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 7, verses 55 to 60, the death of Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. First Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 5a say, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. If you've been in the church for a long time, I'm sure you will have heard sermons on this text. It is a treasured and a precious text, and rightly so. It's a wonderful description of what the people of God are. The basic metaphor of living stones derives first from Christ, who is the living stone, but it extends to us who are invited to present ourselves as living stones. The metaphor is striking, even contradictory. Can you imagine two things further apart than a stone and something that's alive and living? And yet it's a very poignant and powerful me metaphor, especially in the times in which we are living. You see, for generations, centuries, humans have built in stone and wood things that are hard and not living. And in our own time, the last century, we have built huge cities in which we live, made of concrete and steel and glass. And our reaction to and attitude to the living world has often been to treat it as fodder for our economy, something to be trodden underfoot and disregarded. In this time, we are rediscovering that we are part of the living world. That's why I've come out here, surrounded by nature, to talk to you today. We've discovered that nature can fight back, that our mastery of nature has limits. As we stay locked in our homes for fear of a tiny virus, we are discovering again ourselves as part of nature, that we are not just cogs in a machine or bricks in a wall, we are flesh and blood, part of creation. And as such, we share in the mortality and the fragility of all living things. It reminds us that we're not bulletproof. We're not immortal. We're not stones. We are living beings. But the writer of 1 Peter invites us to present ourselves as living stones. The word stone here is uh, presented in the sense of a foundation. But we're asked though living people to present ourselves as something that can be dependable and reliable, strong even though fragile, someone on which other people can build their lives. The writer goes on in that verse to say that these living stones must be built together. We're living through a time when we are learning just how much of our lives are built on one another. We're learning how dependent we are upon health professionals as we discover our fragile interconnection and our shared vulnerability. In this time of lockdown and necessary economic stimulus, we're discovering how much the economy depends 
upon one another? How many livelihoods are built upon the behavior and the custom of other people? We're realizing how our social bonds are built by bringing people together from the level of families to communities to whole societies. We are built together in society. And for some of us, we're also discovering that our spiritual lives have an element in which we are built together. If we look through the whole of 1 Peter, we see some of the spiritual qualities that the writer enjoins upon his readers. An attention to mystery, a holding on to hope, and a grasping of courage. Being built together is particularly important for those who are part of the Church of Jesus Christ. As uh, 1 Corinthians puts it, we are members one of another. Our lives are interlocking and we are meant to be people who are interdependent and able to rely on one another. So the living stones must be built together into a spiritual house. A house has the sense of a coherent structure that provides shelter, gives room for hospitality, and above all, delivers safety. It's talking about a spiritual house, not a physical house. It's not talking about the church as an institution or a body. It's talking about it as a home in which we can feel relaxed and safe. Now, if you've been following our Bible Chef podcasts, you will know that First Peter is addressed to the exiles of the dispersion. And a lot of people have really struggled, even Bible translators have struggled with how to understand what that means. And yet if you're an exile or a refugee or a migrant or a sojourner or a traveler or a visitor, any of those things, you know how important housing and shelter is. If you're a refugee or a migrant, Building a house is one of the big challenges that you face. And getting a house is a sign that you have finally arrived and you belong. The Box Hill Baptist Church has known this through many decades as we have walked with and supported different communities of people who were migrants and refugees when they arrived. We've been involved in housing the poor. We know how important building a house and finding a place is. Well, friends, we are sharing in a moment in history where all of us are in exile. We are between an old world and a new world that is to come. This moment that we're in may go on for quite a long time, but our world is definitely changing. And one of the challenges before us as a generation of Christians is to build a new spiritual house. Our old understandings of society and church will change. So we need to enter into the new age and to bring ourselves, our insights, our lives, our loves to the project of building the shape of the new church. The age we are living in demands nothing less. Now it's really ironic but beautiful that the lectionary has paired this call to be living stones from 1 Peter with the story of the death of the first martyr in Acts. Living stones, dead preachers. But you see, that's quite intentional because the death of Stephen too was a form of foundation. It was the beginning of a new chapter in the story of the people of God. It's a beautiful, artful detail and not just a, a, a little uh, bit of local colour that the text tells us that those who stoned Stephen laid their coats at the feet of a man named Saul. That man named Saul was to go on and build on the foundation that Stephen in his death laid. For well, he became Paul, the one who took the church out of its little Jewish framework to embrace the whole of the Gentile world. And we 
are part of the Church of Jesus Christ because of the death of Stephen and the work of Paul. One of the great maxims of the church is that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, that it's through suffering that the church grows and becomes established. So it's quite consistent between those two texts. It's all about foundations and building and life. Friends, we are entering into a time of building and renovation. That is the deep spiritual task of our age. Nothing less than the whole reframing of spiritual life and building a new spiritual house. How will our ministry change with a changing world? We don't know. There'll certainly be less travel and probably more video communications but a huge range of challenge and change is confronting us and must be engaged. What will all of this mean for community? What will it mean, for instance, of the new community that we hope to foster and bring into being? A worshipping Chinese-speaking community that we hope will grow alongside us at Box Hill. The current social situation means huge challenges for that new initiative. In a more immediate sense, what will it mean for our understanding of communion? And I've recently put up on the church website a blog which raises some of the issues about what we're going to do about communion, something that we hope to discuss together at our virtual church meeting on the 24th of May. This journey is going to take us into deep and interesting territory. There are just two things I want to talk to you about with regard to the coming task of building a new house. The first is that it will engage with our attitude to creation and our place in it. That's, as I said, why I'm here. We've got to see ourselves far more as a part of the created order, not something over it, something that lives off it but is not part of it and shares its fate, its vulnerability, its challenges. And for us, that's going to have to be worked through theologically and spiritually as we place creation into our frameworks of faith and understanding and our, our frameworks of faithfulness and stewardship far more directly and intentionally than we ever have before. A second dimension of our building task is going to be exploring the tension between communications technology in all of its forms and the spiritual life. Personally, I'm more and more interested in this and finding that a rediscovery of prayer, finding again the importance of solitude, engaging with the spiritual discipline of waiting, finding the power of longing and understanding the true treasure of being able to be with people. These are elements of the spiritual life that we are beginning to re-understand through the experience that we are going through. And so, my living stones, I look forward to working with you as together we seek to engage and be part of the spiritual house that the future will need. May God be with us as we enjoy our place within creation and look forward to the kingdom that is to come through Jesus Christ the Lord. May Christ lead us through this time of difficulty and in all of our hopes and endeavours for the future. Amen. Prayer is a great gift and mystery. I'm sitting here in my house and you are sitting in yours, different places and at different times. And yet through the mystery of prayer, we join together our hearts and minds and offer our fears and our hopes and our concerns for others to the throne of grace, as that wonderful old expression is. Shall we pray together? Eternal and mysterious God, 
We praise you that through your gracious love and the power of your spirit, we earthen, stony-hearted people can become living stones built together into a spiritual house. We praise you for the miracle of grace, forgiveness and renewal whereby this happens. And we offer our grateful thanks for every house, physical and spiritual, where we have ever felt welcome, safe and at home. Lord, in this time of great change, we thank you for the architects and builders of tomorrow, and we pray for them. For all medical staff and those of associated disciplines who through their work preserve and protect life itself. For visionaries and prophets who can tell us what tomorrow will look like. For those who shape and build the social context of tomorrow, academics and researchers, policy workers and politicians. We pray that the costs of the Tomorrow Project will not fall upon the poor or the sick or the vulnerable or upon our fellow creatures with whom humanity shares this earth. We pray for churches and spiritual communities, including our own, as we face the tasks of growing your church into a very different tomorrow. Lord, as we look to tomorrow, we pray for those who are suffering today, for those who are ill with COVID-19 and all who have lost the ones they love. For those who are lonely and isolated and anxious for tomorrow, that they might have peace and find hope. For women and children who are quarantined with an abuser, that they might be safe and find the wisdom and the courage to protect themselves as best they can. For those who have lost employment or relationships or business or livelihoods through the impact of this pandemic. For societies, especially poorer societies, or societies yet to experience the full impact of this disease as they seek to protect and support their citizens. God of yesterday, today and forever, who promised to be with us to the end of the age, walk with us, we pray. Lead us, we pray. And bring us safely to the shore of tomorrow, whatever it may look like. Amen.